this is called Universal Basic Income Explained. Free money for everybody in the UBI. It's a 10 minute and five second long video. I like Universal Basic Income for a lot of reasons. And so let's watch it and see what they have to say. What if the state covered your cost of living? Would you still go to work? Go back to school? I mean, I work at home, so. Not work at all. What would you do? This concept is called a Universal Basic Income, or UBI. Well, I don't believe in them covering everything. Uh, and it's nothing less than the most ambitious social policy of our times. In 2017, basic income is gaining momentum around the world. First trials true. are ongoing or on their way, and a growing number of countries are considering UBI as an alternative to welfare. It is. It is technically welfare, but... How would it work, and what are the key arguments for and against? Right now, people can't really agree what universal basic income is or should be. Some want to use it to eliminate welfare and cut bureaucracy. Yes. Others... That's what I... That's why I like UBI. I think that welfare... The, the way that welfare works... In, I'm, in, I'm from the United States, obviously. That's why I'm the, the most alpha person in the world. But my biggest problem with welfare is that it's conditional. So what that means is... For instance, one of the conditions of welfare is you have to be poor. That makes a lot of sense, right? Because why would you give money to people who don't need it or, or who are not poor? The problem is, is that it incentivizes being poor, right? If you're told that if you make more than $10,000 a year, you're going to lose your welfare, you're not going to want to make more because you're going to be afraid. And once you're off the system, it's hard to get back in. And that's, one, that's a big problem I have with welfare. It also incentivizes single motherhood. You get more money if you're a single mom. Why not have more kids to make more money? There's a lot of abuse in this system. And so I'm for a universal basic income that's not conditional. You get it regardless. I believe in a $1,000 a month UBI, but there are a lot of different types. Some people, and I think probably the most reasonable UBI to implement is what we call the negative income tax. So the poorer you are, the more the government will give you money back instead of collecting money from your taxes. So if you only make like $10,000 a year, let's say maybe you'll get $10,000 back from the government. And maybe if you make $50,000 a year, you'll get like less or something. You get my point? That makes sense to me too, because it, it has the, a bit of the conditionality, but it, it's easy to get onto because it just calculates the total accumulated income. So I actually like something like that. I would be fine with a negative income tax. I do think that the middle class needs to experience UBI too. It can't just be for poor people because we are seeing a radical shift of what is rich and whatnot. But we're seeing a big problem where wages are getting cut down by a lot of because of automation. And so fundamentally, we need to tax automation and redistribute it to people. There are whole factory towns in the United States that are on permanent unemployment and disability because their jobs just f are fucking gone. There are a lot of areas that are dependent on like one source of income, where if that factory is gone, every, all the infrastructure around is dead. And so throwing a welfare at it makes sense to stabilize it kind of, but it doesn't really help. It doesn't allow people to come up with alternative sources of income. Think about it. Your factory has gone. You're on welfare. Great. Now welfare is keeping your state alive. Okay. Well, how does that welfare make the community better? It doesn't. It puts it in a stasis. Now imagine you just gave everybody like $1,000 a month. All of a sudden, big businesses and small businesses are going to come to the area so that they can start making money from the area. More money in the area. This is an alternative to raise, like drastically raising uh, minimum wage. So this way we don't have to stress out small businesses specifically. It's a really pro small business type of a thing. It's a good idea fundamentally. We just have to figure out the specific way to implement it. Wanted as a free extra for existing programs, or well, you literally just couldn't afford welfare and UBI. It's just fucking dumb. Uh, again, like if you were getting welfare on top of your UBI or UBI on top of your, well, what was what's your incentive to get off of welfare? It's or even want it to be so high that work itself becomes optional. Not really that much. I, I, I this is in addition to working. This way you'd get money plus working. We could lower it from a thousand dollars, but for this video, we'll talk mostly. Plus, for people that live in poor areas where they're... Because this would be optional. You can maintain your current welfare or get UBI. For poorer areas where kids are destined to go into either like the... Um, 
the jail system or whatever, or just to go on to the welfare system anyway, it gives them an alternative. Like, here's a thousand dollars. Go be ambitious. Go do something. It puts more money in the communities. The about the minimum basic income. And then one more, and then money in the community attracts more money. Like we said, other businesses come there. It gets rid of things like food deserts. There are areas that are so poor. There's like a fucking McDonald's is your main source of food because it's close enough and you don't have transportation. All of a sudden, you're going to kill those food deserts. You see more conven a convenience source. More money will be circulating around those areas, which means that people can decide to increase their taxes because they have the UBI, which makes their schools better. It gives you more affordability to, uh, to do a babysitting. It gives you the ability to be a babysitter and not make that much money because you have a UBI. You see how everything builds on top of itself? Come. Enough money to be above the poverty line. In the US, this means about $1,000 a month or $12,000 a year. Yeah, I'm into that. The money would not be taxed and yes, you could do true. whatever you wanted with it. And I like the fact that it's just you get the money to decide what you want to do with the money. This way the government, it's, it's like instead of the government telling you, hey, this is what you need to do with it, give it to people, let them make their best choices. A lot of people counter this argument by saying, well, what if people make bad decisions? Half of a bad decision is your ability to recuperate from it. Okay, if I go and spend a thousand dollars on a fucking new computer, would you call that a bad decision? Probably not. If I didn't have any money and I did that, you'd say it's a bad decision. Bad decisions are partially due to <clears throat> if you have the ability to recover from it. Additionally, what people need to understand is that your IQ drops significantly. Like I think it's 12 points based on a study when you're poor, simply because you're so stressed about making ends meet that you can't think properly. So yeah, poor people might spend it incorrectly, but you know what? It's still putting money into, the, it's still circulating money through the economy. So your worst case scenario is people have more money to spend irresponsibly, but it's going through the economy, creating new jobs anyway. No solution is perfect. In this scenario, UBI is a way of transferring the wealth of a society while still keeping the free market intact. Yeah, I like that idea. But if we hand out free money, will people just spend it on booze and stop working? A 2013 some study by the World Bank some specifically... Pe some people are going to do that, yes. ...examined if poor people waste their handouts on tobacco and alcohol if they receive it in the form of cash. I will say from a long-term perspective, though, people are going to be less addicted to substances because they're not going to feel like they need to self-medicate anymore and they can see a doctor because they have the money to do so. So even if you see the current generation increase or stabilize the amount of addictive substances they consume, the next generations are going to be able to get off of those addictive substances because they're going to be able to get doctor's visits. On top of that, I would argue that a lot of the stressors in life for a lot of young kids comes from the fact that they feel like they're not going to be able to achieve the American dream of working hard and having it pay off to live in the future, be able to retire and just relax. So you're removing stressors from people and giving people the money to deal with the stressors that they already have on top of that. The clear answer, no, they don't. The opposite is true. Other studies have shown that the richer you are, the more drugs and alcohol you consume. The lazy and drunk... Well, doesn't that... Doesn't that invalidate what you're saying? If if the studies suggest that the more money you have, the more alcohol you consume, doesn't that mean that they're going to have more money and consume more alcohol? Poor person is a stereotype rather than reality. What about laziness? Universal basic income test runs done in Canada in the 1970s showed that around 1% of the recipients stopped working, mostly to take care of their kids. On Here's the thing. Do I think that UBI would immediately make people lazy? No. First of all, we've become lazier as a society overall. Jobs are easier because of technology. That's just a fact. Second of all, the laziness would come in the next generation growing up on UBI. This is something I don't think we talk about a lot. I think that when uh, something gets implemented on a current generation that's used to having... Um, compared to the new system, a shitty experience on an old system, they usually appreciate it more. So if you implemented a UBI for me, I'd be like, oh, I really appreciate it. This is awesome. My kids, though, are probably going to be fucking entitled little dickheads. So a lot of this is going to have to be cultural and teaching kids to actually appreciate this shit. Average, people reduce their working hours by less than 10%. The extra time was used to achieve goals like going back to school or looking for better jobs. I don't think that reduced work hours is a negative. 
I think it's fine. I think reduced hours is a positive. If we have the means to do it, why should we make people work 40 hours? If you can, first of all, there are studies that suggest that working like four, like uh, 32 hours, four day work weeks are increased productivity because you give people the goal of leaving early. But more than that, if we have the means to do it, why the fuck do we need to work 40 hours? Technology is supposed to exist to make our lives easier. Okay, right now, technology has allowed us on this stream, me to sit down and watch another video and you guys to consume it at the cost of ad revenue, watching a 30 second advertisement. That's so different than the way that life used to work. You used to have to buy a whole video of some fat fucking idiot sitting down talking about something. You, you get what I'm saying? Te technology is meant to make things easier and more accessible to us. So who fucking cares if you work less? Our jobs are disappearing because of technology. So like, hey, if jobs are disappearing, what if we cut work hours to 30 and you get a UBI? And maybe now you have more time to do things that you enjoy. But if laziness and drugs are not a huge deal, why doesn't our current welfare state solve poverty? Welfare or unemployment programs often come with a lot of strings attached. I'm going to come. I'm going to come. I'm, this is exactly what I'm talking about. The string, the, the conditionality, the strings attached. That's what I'm talking about. This is the fucking, this is what I mean. Like taking part in courses, applying to a certain number of jobs a month, or accepting any kind of job offer, no matter if it's a good fit. Well, that's not my, more like you having to be poor to get it incentivizes being poor. Ah. or what it pays. Besides the loss of personal freedom, these conditions are often a huge waste of time and only serve to make the unemployment statistics seem less bad. Well, a lot of people will just fudge it, and they'll just fudge uh, welfare programs. Often, your time would be much better spent looking for the right job, continuing education. I don't really believe in the right job necessarily. Sometimes you just have to suck it up and work a job, as long as you can tolerate it. But I get what they're saying. Or starting a business. Another unwanted side effect of many welfare programs is that they trap people in poverty and promote passive behavior. See? Imagine True. a benefit of $1,000 each month. In a lot of programs, if you earn a single dollar extra, the whole thing is taken away. True. If you take a job that and it's difficult to get back into it, that's paying $1,200, you might not only lose your benefits, but because of your taxes and other costs like transportation, you might end up having less money than before. Sure. So if you actively try to better your situation and your total income is not improving or even shrinking, welfare can create a ceiling that traps people. In it makes you, why the fuck would you get off welfare? I wouldn't. You know what I'm saying? Like, I wouldn't do it. I'm not going to fucking, like, if I can make more money doing nothing, why would I do anything? That's, this makes no sense. In poverty and rewards passive behavior. A basic income can never be cut, and therefore getting a job and additional income will always make your financial situation better. Work is always rewarded. Instead of a ceiling, it creates a floor from which people can lift themselves up. True. But True. even if UBI is the better model, is it economically feasible? What about inflation? Won't prices just rise, making everything just like it was before? So here's the thing with the uh, UBI. There's a lot going on here. When it comes to the cost, Andrew Yang's UBI laid out a uh, UBI. Uh, you would implement a value-added tax. Now, a value-added tax is a tax. It would be a 10%. Is a sales tax onto goods and services. Uh, that would that between that the increase of money in the system uh, and cutting other welfare programs passively. You're looking at about like two and a half, maybe like a little less than 2.5 trillion of a $3 trillion headline cost. The other amount of money can honestly get, come from reversing uh, things like Donald Trump's horrible tax. Like, I'm sorry, but like I didn't like Donald Trump's tax cuts, but they're not necessary anymore because you have a UBI. So like, oh yeah, you're not making an extra $10 a check, but you're making an extra $1,000 a month. So it doesn't really matter. So it can be paid for with cutting things down, implementing a value at tax and cutting down on some frivolous bullshit. Um... As far as inflation, yeah, inflation is going to happen. There's going to be more money into the system and a universal basic income, I mean, excuse me, an evaluated tax that increases the prices of your goods and services. However, it's not going to completely invalidate the amount of money, right? right? Let's say that you impl implement a universal basic income with a 10% increased cost of goods and services through a VAT tax, right? And let's say you make $50,000 a year and now you make 62 and a half, you, you make $50,000 a year, right? And Let's just say, hypothetically, it costs you $50,000 a year in expenses in order for you to live, 
Well, with a UBI, now you're making $62,500 a year. And even if the cost of your goods and services go up 10% and it now costs you $55,000 a year, you now went from making fifty dollars a year to spending fifty dollars a year to making $62,000 a year and spending $55,000 a year, giving you $7,000 more a year. You just net gained. The for the most part, the free market economy will work itself out because McDonald's isn't going to quadruple the price of their hamburgers because then fucking Burger King's going to tell you to kill yourself and they're going to fucking reduce the, they're going to keep their prices as stable as possible. So you're not going to see, as long as there's competition in areas, you're not going to see price gouging like that. Now, there are areas like food deserts and poor areas that are dominated by one particular fast food industry or grocery store. The thing is, is when you're getting $1,000 more a month, there's more money in the economy to incentivize small businesses and big businesses to coming into the area and trying to get that money. And so you're going to see competition added into those areas, which solves the problem of food deserts in general. So you're not going to see it from there. The biggest part that I would be worried about, excuse me, is um, when it comes to housing. Because you do have some landlords who engage in predatory tactics to increase. They'll just be like, oh, fuck it. You're making $1,000 more. Well, I'm charging $500 more a month. That's something we would have to independently take care of. But I will tell you one thing. If the only issue with a universal basic income that would have a profoundly positive impact on the economy is that some scumbag fucks would take that money, then that means that the next step that we have to take is to take away those. We need to take away those landlords property. We can pay them for it and we need someone else to run it. That's not going to try to steal money from people and do engage in tactics that I would consider borderline treasonous. You know, it's like, hey, we have a really good uh, system to implement to help poor people and middle class people. Oh, okay, well, I'm going to use that and I'm going to drastically increase the price of your uh, you living here because you need to live somewhere. Just take it away from them. Implement some kind of rent control. Since the money is not being created by magic or printers, it needs to be transferred from somewhere. It's more of a shift of funds than the creation of new ones. Hence, no inflation. Well, okay, okay. There, you can't say no inflation because inflation doesn't come from just printing money. More money in the market will generally increase inflation. That's why the whatever the fuck it's called, the, the treasury, I forget what it's called. It's just I'm drawing a blank. But that's why the uh, whatever, that's why they, they control the inflation, uh, control. That's why they control interest rates on loans because when lower interest rates happen more people take out more loans and then more money's in the economy which gen will theoretically lower the value of the dollar so yes you will see inflation you can't ignore that like i think that that's a, a miss there to just say there's no inflation like yes you're shifting funds but with more money circulating through the economy you will see inflation that doesn't mean it's going to be uncontrollable i think that this the estimates are like six percent inflation with a ten percent value added tax so it's not going to be like this insane destructive of inflation the the overall value of life or quality of life is going to just skyrocket hey, but how do we pay for it there's no right answer here because the world is too diverse how well off a country is what the local values are are things like high taxes or cutting the defense budget politically acceptable or not? Well, we can't really cut our defense budget in America because they would fucking you'd have a meltdown. But we could stall it. You know, I think that we use like fifty billion dollars a year in America. A year in America just goes to bullshit in our military, so that because if you don't use it, you'll lose it for the next year. Isn't that interesting? So fifty billion dollars a year. It's fucking crazy. Stay tuned. Yeah. How much welfare state is already in place, and is it effective? The way I would do it, value added tax. I think about. I know it's. I know it's a regressive tax. You can make it progressive by uh, charging small businesses less of a VAT tax and big businesses more, like Amazon. But more than anything else, one of the very good things about a VAT tax that I see is that you, we have to understand the framing of money. Um, I like VAT tax because it's difficult to dodge VAT taxes. One of the biggest problems that we have in America are companies like Amazon, the fuck, dodging their taxes. And VAT taxes, value added tax, is very difficult to dodge. And so the reason I say that is this, right? Um, <clears throat> We have an issue of companies like Amazon hiring big lawyers and whatnot to figure out ways to play the system and to not pay their taxes. And so they'll they'll like put the money through another country, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you can't dodge a value added tax at all, really. It's very difficult. So you'd actually have to pay. So it starts solving the problem of uh, tax dodging from big companies. However, one thing people do criticize, they'll say something like, well, a VAT tax because you would pay, you would pay the consumer. They say, well, the fat tax is on the consumer where traditional taxes aren't. Here's the thing, the framing of money, right? Let's say I sell a thing. I don't know why I'm going to do this on here, but let's say I sell a thing for a dollar. This is a dollar right here. 
I sell, I don't know, I sold like grass for a dollar. Who cares? Well, if I sell it for a dollar and there's no taxes on it, I'm taking that one dollar, right? I'm getting the one dollar. You're paying me one dollar, right? You're giving me a dollar. Now, let's say the government comes by and says, okay, well, we're going to tax this service by 10%. Well, now I'm only, you're paying me a dollar, but I'm only getting 90 cents. So what I'm probably going to do is say, okay, I need to offset that by charging a dollar fit. I'm going to start charging a dollar 10 for this. I know that the math isn't perfect. So this way I get this. So now you're paying a dollar 10 to me. And I'm getting a dollar and then the government will come and they'll get 10 cents. Well, let's say in scenario number two, instead of implement the traditional tax on a government, on a business, you know, the business says, instead of this, we're just going to charge an extra 10 cents and we're going to take that. Well, I, as a consumer am now paying or whoever's consuming, who gives a shit is paying a dollar and 10 cents. I know my drawing is terrible. Holy fuck. I'm getting a dollar and the government's getting 10 cents. It's the same thing. It's the framing of money, right? It's the same thing as if you look at it from an inflation perspective. What, what, what sounds better to you? Making $20 an hour this year and making, uh, and t okay, inflation is about 2.5%, right? So let's say today, this year, you made $20 an hour. Right? You made, let's just say you made $50,000 a year. Well, next year, that money is going to be worth like $49,000 a year based on inflation. However, if you ask people, would you rather make $50,000 next year, but then worth less because of inflation, or would you rather just lose $1,000 out of your paycheck? You're probably going to prefer the one that gives you more money because it has higher perceived value. So that's the framing of money. People are okay with inflation removing the more of their money. They're not okay with it, but they're more okay with it than actually just having physical money taken away from them. And so that's the same thing, framing of money. And that's why I like value-added taxes. Each country has its own individual path to a UBI. The easiest way to pay for a UBI is to end all welfare and use the free funds. Well, to you don't it. you don't end it. You would allow people to maintain it and then opt out of it for the for the benefit of a UBI instead. You if you get this way it's passably some people might benefit more from a traditional welfare system. You don't want to ruin their lives. Let them choose to come off of it or stay on it. That's it. Not only would this make a number of government agencies disappear, which in itself saves money, it would also eliminate a lot of bureaucracy. That's true. On the other hand, cutting them could leave many people worse off than before. If the goal is to have a foundation for everybody, there still need to be programs of some sort, because just like countries, people are not the same. The second way, higher taxes, especially for the very wealthy. In the US, for example, there's been a lot of economic growth, but most of the benefits from it have gone to the richest few percent. Sure. The wealth gap is rapidly widening, and many argue that it might be time to distribute the spoils more evenly to preserve the social peace. Yeah, true. There could be taxes. Even, even some rich people like Warren Buffett, Elon Musk, even they're saying we need a UBI because they understand that there needs to be people to consume their products for their products to, keep, to maintain circulation. On financial transactions, capital, land value, carbon, or even robots. But UBI is not necessarily expensive. According to a recent study, a UBI of $1,000 per month in the US could actually grow the GDP by 12% over eight years because it would enable poor people to spend more and increase overall demand. Well, yeah, of course. What about the people who do the dirty work? Who will work in the fields, crawl through sewers, or lift pianos? If you don't need to for survival, will people still do hard, boring, and unfulfilling labor? I mean, it's possible. That's an interesting question, though, because you may not, you may opt out of like a very high earning thing like that. Um, you would just have to incentivize that job more. I don't know what to tell you. You know, I don't think that people will just disappear from that. UBI might give them enough leverage to demand better pay and working conditions. A study calculated that every extra dollar going to wage earners would add about $1.21 to the national economy, while every extra dollar going to high-income Americans would add only 39 cents. There would still be very rich and poor people, but we could eliminate fear, suffering, and... Well, yeah, you make the poor richer and the rich poorer. It makes sense to do that, because I think that... I like, I like the fundamental idea of having classes 
I'm fine with poor and rich people. I'm not fine with super poor and super rich people. It makes sense because then you have something to aspire to as a poor person. But you also have the means to actually attain that thing that you aspire to. We also have to acknowledge that not everybody's the same. There are people who are just, like, listen, not going to be a fucking asshole. But there are people who are just not as, as good as other people. It might be because they didn't get enough education growing up. It might be because genetically they just suck. It might just be because their talents aren't appreciated in this current era where maybe 100 years ago they would. So you do want the better people for the current society to rise to the top while also allowing the less good people to live. And potentially when they're maybe maybe they will be more beneficial to society 100 years later, their, their offspring. You know, maybe they have like a particular talent that we don't know. I don't know. Maybe manual labor will come back. I think you get the point. And the existential panic for a significant part of the population. Making poor citizens better off could be a smart economic tactic. For some, this isn't enough. They want a UBI large enough to live a middle class existence. Well, no, that's stupid. If we set the financial obstacle aside, this idea fundamentally challenges how our society is constructed. By earning money, you earn the possibility to take part in society. This determines your status and options, but it also forces many people into spending huge chunks of their time on things they don't care about. That, that's just life, man. You gotta work. Not everybody's gonna enjoy everything that they do in life. You know, that's in just... 2016, only 33% of US employees were engaged at work, 16% were actively miserable, and the remaining 51% were only physically present. Would 67% of people stop working if they could? Maybe. It would be unfair <laughs> to portray work as just a chore. Work gives us something to do. It challenges us. It mo hey, it's SpongeBob. Motivates us to improve. It forces us to engage. Many find friends or partners at work. We work for social status, wealth, and our place in the world. We're looking for- Yeah, a lot of people, work gives you meaning in your life, man. Something to do with our lives. And for many people, work gives them meaning. There are other concerns with UBI. If all welfare programs were exchanged for one single payment, this gives the government a lot of leverage. Why? Individual programs are easier to attack or cut than a multitude. Or popular. Well, I get what you're saying there, but I also feel like... I mean, that makes sense. Like, you could just go after a UBI and say, hey, we'll just cut this one UBI. But I do think that it's better that you get control over what you want to do with your money. Everybody has individual needs, right? Like if you ask somebody if they'd rather have a $30,000 or a $30,000 car, they would choose the $30,000 because they can do whatever they want or need with it. Like you may not need a car. This way you can use it on something else. Like, I don't know, fucking strippers, whatever you need. This might promise drastic changes to the UBI to get into power. And a universal basic income doesn't tackle all problems when it comes to inequality. Rents, for example. While $1,000 might be great in the countryside, it's not a lot for expensive metropolitan areas. See, that thing I actually think is good. I want to explain to you why. Not the rent part, but the fundamentals where like $1,000 would be more beneficial in other areas. We could come up with, we could make it less than 1000 or we figure that out. But here's my thing. In, more, in cities generally are healthier job-wise. There's usually more job availability in cities. And so you don't necessarily need that $1,000 to mean as much. A lot of people I live in New York are working two jobs. So there's a lot of jobs to be had, but a lot of them don't pay enough. So you have to work two. Well, if you had a UBI, maybe you could quit one, right? The $1,000 may not mean as much money in the sense of like it doesn't, it's not as, high, as valuable as $1,000 in like fucking Kansas, but you're going to have better job availability and the jobs that you have will generally pay more than the jobs in other places. Whereas the poor areas with unhealthy local economies, they need a higher uh, value of $1,000 because they have unhealthy economies. They need to incentivize people coming there. And what's going to happen is, yeah, those areas are going to become gentrified a little bit. Uh, they're going to be, they're, the cost of living will go up a little bit because more people will have more money and they're going to increase their property values, blah, 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 and all the other stuff. So I think that that's actually not a negative. I think it's almost a positive. Which could lead to poor people moving outwards and the difference between rich and poor becoming even more extreme. And of course, for some people, the concept of work itself not being essential for survival is appalling. 
So is the universal... That looks like a play mat when I was a kid. ...universal basic income a good idea? Yes. The honest answer is that we don't know yet. I do know. There needs to be a lot more research, more and bigger <laughs> test runs. We need to think about what kind of UBI we want and what we're prepared to give up to pay for it. The potential is huge. It might be the most promising model to sustainably eliminate poverty. It might seriously reduce the amount know. of desperation in the world and make us... Well, let's not say the world. This is a first world country thing. This isn't something that's going to be implemented in another country. It probably should be. But we're not there yet. We're just advocating for a UBI in America and shit like that. You know, we haven't even thought about second and third world countries. Ooh. But we probably should if we could theoretically implement a UBI for the entire world. That would be very interesting. Much less stressed out. This Once I'm president, I'll take over China and Russia, and then I'm going to run the world in a very healthy dictatorship. And I'm going to give the whole world a universal basic income, and we're all going to be happy. Video was made possible by a universal basic income provided by you, our viewers. Eat the birds. 10,000 people around the world gift us a monthly income on patreon.com. Whoa, shut the fuck up. Trying to take these people's money? You don't need it. You got fucking 9 million views. Do you know how much money that is? I don't fucking know. 9 million views, bro? Shit. That's a lot of fucking money, bro. <laughs> That's a lot of fucking money. Let me see. Let me do something. Let me, let me do a little bit of math. It really depends on a, a lot of circumstances, but let's just say it's roughly fifty thousand dollars for this one video. I think that's a reasonable assumption there. Will UBI ever happen? Do I think it's possible? Shoot. Yes. It was a good video though. I liked it. You guys know I love UBI. I haven't talked about UBI in a very long time. 